Hi YouTube, welcome back. First video in a while, um, but I wanted to do an update on my Suzuki Jimny. So I've had it three and a half years now. So it's gonna be a little bit of a roundup of the ownership experience, what it's like to live with, um, all of the modifications, off-roading and daily driving. It's gonna probably be a bit of a long one, so feel free to skip on a little bit if you want to, um, to one of the different parts. Um, but we'll try and go through in a logical order. So as you can see, here's the Jimny. So we're in the UK. So this is an SZ5 spec. So at the time, Suzuki was selling the SZ4 and the SZ5. The SZ4 was like a base model. Came with steel wheels, halogen headlights, basic aircon. Um, lacked quite a few of the other features. I don't think it had heated seats, it had a plastic steering wheel. And then for not a huge amount more money, uh, they sold the SZ5 which is what we've got here. So three and a half years ago, I paid list price for this, uh, which was 19 and a half thousand pounds. Um, I believe today you would still be able to get more money than that selling it second hand. Um, I haven't actively looked recently, but you don't generally see them advertised for sort of 22 to 24, maybe even 26,000 pounds still. Um, I've got no intentions of actually selling this. So it's not really a real concern on the value there. And it, I never bought it with the intention of the, you know, strong residuals or wanting to make a profit from it. Go through what it's been like, what the dealership's like. So it was a little bit of a, a rocky start with it. Uh, not initially, the dealership I bought it from were very good. They didn't try and rip me off on the price. There were lots of stories about dealers charging over list price for, for models or pre-registering them so they could then sell them a second hand and charge more money. They didn't do that to me. So I'm very pleased that it was 19 and a half grand. Had it have been more, it would have been out of budget at the time. And in the UK, this is the only four by four that you can buy anything close to this sort of price. So three and a half years ago, the next nearest vehicle in terms of sort of capability and build structure would have been a Jeep Wrangler. Uh, and they started at £49,000 back then. They're a lot more expensive now. And there was literally nothing else sort of comparable. You could have perhaps looked at a short wheel base um, Land Cruiser. So in the UK, we just get the Land Cruiser Prado badged as a Land Cruiser. But it was mostly only the commercial version they did in the short wheel base. And it's okay, but they're a bit fugly. They're in independent suspension at the front. They're quite a bit bigger, quite a bit heavier. Um, certainly a very different style of vehicle. It probably wouldn't have been on my list to consider. Um, and then we've just got a host of sort of soft roaders and crossovers. So the Jimny really was the only vehicle in that price category. So here we are, three and a half years later. We've got 23 and a half thousand miles on the clock. Um, no idea what that is in kilometers. I'll, I'll try and post it up on the screen. Um, so my first dealership, I'm going to say first because there's a little bit of a story here. Um, I bought the car a little bit before the whole COVID thing kicked off and all the lockdown. Um, so several months into ownership, uh, that dealership actually folded and closed, uh, which was a shame because it actually seemed quite friendly and nice. Um, I did get them to do a couple of bits. They'd had the car in and fitted the uh, factory or optional reversing camera to it. They did scratch the screen. Um, in the vehicle doing it which i didn't notice and then it all went into lockdown and sadly i never got them to resolve that um, before they then disappeared so i ended up using another uh, dealership which was actually a bit more local but it was one that i'd already fallen out with because they were just pretty useless um, you went in there and you know you had bits of ceiling falling down it was scruffy the staff were rude didn't really have a lot of choice anyhow we, we used them for a few years so they've done the rest of the servicing um, on it and we've had a few I think it was one recall and a bit of warranty work um, that dealership has now closed as well they do have another one but it's further away again so not really overly impressed with the with the dealers um, and I'd have to say every time I contacted Suzuki UK they've been absolutely hopeless and useless they just seem to have absolutely no interest at all in either their customers customer care or wanting to try and retain you as a customer so Suzuki, 
don't really think much of you. You wouldn't inspire me to buy a vehicle from you again based on the service. Uh, it's going to be purely down to the individual vehicle, whether I like it or not. You certainly don't get any loyalty from me. Uh, I bought a smart car before this. I've only ever bought two new vehicles. The smart car, I would say the dealership experience was much better. Um, he went through like a Mercedes entrance and he was a bit posher. And, you know, the smart car didn't cost much. It was like 14 grand new, but it always came back fully valeted. And when I say valeted, it was inside and out. Absolutely sort of professional job. It must've taken them several hours just to clean the car. It wasn't a quick wash over. Um, and they couldn't be more helpful. You always got a cup of coffee or a cup of tea given to you. You know, they couldn't do enough for you. Suzuki, no, never been offered anything. They actively refuse to wash the car uh, any time it's been in, whether it's for a service, whether it's been for warranty work, or whether it's been for a recall. So yeah, the dealers, really not impressed with, and Suzuki UK. Um, I did have another dealer, so I didn't know a local-ish dealer had opened up again, not far from where the first one closed down. Nobody had contacted me to tell me that there was another dealer there, um, but they actually did phone me up about a month ago, saying, oh, we noticed that your finance deal is gonna come to an end next year. Do you want to buy a new Suzuki? It's like, well, what are you gonna sell me? You don't sell these anymore. If I'm lucky, you might have a commercial, but they're just like base spec, more money and only two seats. And the rest of the Suzuki range, why would I want to buy anything from there? You know, if I want another four by four to actually go off road. So quite bizarre. Suzuki, if ever anybody watches from there, from your organization, you know, you've got to think if you want to retain customers, you need to sell them, you know, you've got to sell something that people want to buy to move on from a vehicle. Um, I'm not going to trade this in just to buy exactly the same thing with a few miles less and a year younger for more money than what you're going to give me. That's, that's a terrible deal, uh, which is what the dealer did offer. Would I like to buy a, you know, a, a 2021 model instead? So why would I want to do that? that that's just stupid so yeah dealership experience big fat thumbs down um, cannot recommend Suzuki dealers at all so I mentioned recall work the only recall I think that was done on this is I think it was something to do with the door latches um, so I did get a letter eventually from my local dealer although I think I had to chase them on it and uh that was done, didn't seem to be any bother. Uh, in terms of warranty work, uh, I had a big ordeal quite early on in ownership where it kept jumping out of low range. So even having gone in, explained it, videoed it doing it, tried to contact Suzuki UK, it was just a complete argument that the dealer wouldn't accept it. In the end, I had to take one of them out and go and take them on an off-road course um, just to prove that it jumped out of gear. They then wanted to dismantle the transfer box to try and find what's wrong with it and try and randomly change parts in it i don't know whether somebody then higher up decided that was a stupid idea and a new transfer box turned up from somewhere and they fitted it and thankfully i can say that did cure the problem um, but that was quite a pain in the ass really um, not overly impressed again um, with the dealership service um, and then apart from just general servicing the only other thing i've really had the dealer do is i had them install uh, the wiring loom for the uh, tow bar. So I actually fitted an aftermarket tow bar and then just got Suzuki to do the, the electrics. I could have done it myself, but it meant pulling bits of trim out. I kind of thought they'd have the right gear to do it. And then, you know, while it was still in warranty, if there were any problems um, with the electrics, I thought it was much better to, to get them to do it. Sadly, that was an all deal as well. The car was absolutely filthy when it was returned to me. They'd managed to pull some bits of trim off of the front somewhere, so I had some clips laying in the footwell, and there were bits of trim trips missing in the back. So I had to march back into their dealership with a handful of bits and say, look, what are these off of? And you've got bits missing in the back. So I had to sit and wait while they then went and rectified the work. Again, cannot recommend Suzuki dealers at all. So before we move on to the rest of the interior, let's just talk about a few of the other issues we've had with the vehicle. Nothing really major. So partway through ownership, the car went very wobbly in its handling. And on inspection at the dealership, it turned out that the front anti-roll bar bracket, uh, a bolt was missing, had come out. So the roll bar wasn't being supported properly and the bush had moved. 
and they're sort of the ones in the center of the car that hold the anti-roll bar on so you can just see the anti-roll bar down there so it's the ones you know on the chassis side um they accused me of having tampered with it again i think that's just a really shit dealership to be honest um it wasn't a bolt that had ever been touched by me so once it was back in place i kind of fixed it although i would say ever since then the vehicle's had a bit more of a wobble um, you kind of hear about it in other reviews and sort of ownership and i never really noticed it before until i had this problem which is as you're driving along sort of has a bit of a sideways wobble and it feels less stable at high speed now than what it did before i know it's a short wheelbase vehicle the track's quite narrow i know it's live axles i'm quite used to those sort of vehicles i've owned land rovers and jeeps um kind of all my life and something just isn't quite as it was but everything sort of checks out there's nothing that looks worn um, or broken it just doesn't seem to be quite as it was likewise the suspension i don't think it rides as well as it did um it kind of to me feels like the shocks are getting a bit knackered which after only three years and twenty-three thousand miles isn't really very much i have used it off-road i've done a small amount of towing but none of it's been that extensive i wouldn't have expected it to be wearing out um all I get from the dealer is, oh, it's got more weight on it because you've got the bumper and some other bits. It's like, well, yeah, but Jimny, the Suzuki specify maximum axle loadings and we're not anywhere close to those. So the vehicle should be fine carrying a bit more weight without wearing out excessively quick. The other thing is the clutch. So the clutch bite point feels quite high to me. I'm sure it's changed. It's one of those things that, you know, when you drive a vehicle every day, it's been gradual, but I certainly think it's higher than it used to be. I've been driving manual cars all my life, so since 1997. Um, I've never had a clutch go on any other vehicle. I've replaced them when I've had work done. I've done some engine swaps and other things, but I'm sure it's not my driving style. And again, I haven't done much that much towing. You know, it's literally less than 500 miles towing it's done. And the off-road has all been fairly mild. And I certainly don't slip the clutch when I'm off-road. Uh, I've been off-roading for longer than I've been driving on the roads um, and it's been mostly in manual vehicles so again we had it out at the dealership that you know the only way they would even consider looking at it is that I'd have to pay all the strip down fee and then I'd have to prove that there was something wrong with it for them to consider not you know and you're talking five six seven maybe even eight hundred quids worth of labor they want to charge just to have a look at the vehicle under warranty um, which is kind of getting stupid. Suzuki UK, again, were absolutely useless. The clutch doesn't slip. It doesn't slip when towing. So, you know, I didn't take the punt on them wanting to strip it down. But I'm, I'm kind of expecting that at some point I'm going to be putting a clutch in it, probably well before I would have expected to. And, and the last rule grumble is the paint. Um, I don't know quite what Suzuki used for paint, but the paint seems to be really soft and we're forever getting stone chips. So hopefully this comes out on the camera. But you see we've got a little chip here. I noticed that yesterday when washing it, literally every time I wash the vehicle, I find a new stone chip. Now the vehicle isn't used for commuting. Um, it's not particularly driven in peak times when there's masses of other cars on the road. And even though the roads in the UK are pretty shoddy at the moment, they're not like gravel roads. So I've got more stone chips on here than is on a 1989 Land Rover that's done 152,000 miles. I, I don't quite know how that computes. Um, the paint on here just must be really, really soft, I think, um, and prone to damage. So I have got some touch-up paint, but you know how much of that can you use? But <laughs> there's been quite a bit of touch-up done on it. Um, you know, just little bits here where, where we've had stone chips. Just do a little tour of the vehicle, shall we, and talk about like standard spec, and then we can look at the modifications and sort of off-roading and driving. I'll find the key. So, just as a minor note, I've got the key here. I don't know if you can see. Um, it's got chrome on the back of it, on the S for Suzuki, and that's all peeled off and gone quite sharp and rough. Um, only a minor thing, but he started doing that quite early on. Um, I suppose I perhaps should have said about it during warranty, but a bit crappy. Um, let's just jump in here. So, 
I don't know if we'll see, but there is a scratch on here. I say that's unfortunately where the dealer scratched it previously. So as you can see, we've got 23 and a half thousand miles on the clock. Um, let's have a little look. We're doing 33.9 MPG. That's about what I get average uh, most of the time. Anywhere between sort of 32 and 34, just running about. So it's reasonably short distance and I do like to put my foot down occasionally. If you go on a longer run, it is perfectly possible to get this up to about 39. Uh, I know people do drive them in the 40s. I'll be honest, I've never seen 40 MPG from this. Um, no matter how I've driven it, and even before it had any mods on it, 39 is about the highest I've ever seen. But it is very dependent on speed. So if you jump on the motorway or dual carriageway, you know, if you're running at over 3,000 RPM, which is about 60 miles an hour, um, you're back down to sort of, you know, 32 to 34 again. But, you know, if you're doing a cross-country journey where you can sort of keep the speed to sort of 50, 55, that's definitely its happiest and its sweet spot. We did do some towing. So in the UK, the Jimny's rated at 1.3 tonnes towing for a brake trailer. So I did tow a caravan, which weighed officially 1,280 kilos. So we we're right on the weight limit. Uh, I was surprised it towed it really well. Obviously lacking a bit of power on steep hills and we were driving into South Wales and we did some really good long climbs. But it still did about 24 mpg um, and that was a was that 240 mile round trip. So really pleased with how it actually towed, all things considered. And I still think it's a great vehicle. I love the styling inside. So the dash has got this lovely sort of stippled look to it. Um, that works really nicely. It is all hard plastics in here. You know, it's nothing really soft touch at all. Um, but it is quite a nice place to be in. And so the SZ5, you get lever wrap steering wheel, you get things like cruise control and a speed limiter. Um, you get all the steering wheel controls. We've got climate control. Um, we've got heated seats, which are just down here. But the best things are, uh, the alloys look great, and we've got LED headlights. And I've driven a few modern cars with LED headlights, and these are by far and away the best LED headlights I've experienced. Um, they're way better than anything I've done aftermarket on other vehicles and say any other vehicle I've driven So things like uh, the current mini and the new defender their lights are good But th th these these headlights are really really good and they're kind of worth that price difference between an SZ4 and an SZ5 So I think if you're buying a commercial spec that doesn't have the headlights on it um, You know, it's a bit of a shame. We do have the uh, the safety features up here. So it's like a little camera um, which does like the lane change and emergency brake. The emergency braking thing is really annoying. It'll flash up red on the dash and beep loud at you. It does do that quite frequently. So if you're driving past a traffic cone, um, there's a couple of bridges around here, sort of on single track roads and it beeps at you and then just randomly, even on a wide open road, it will start beeping. And of course, you know, when the dash lights up red and you get a violent beeping sound at you, the first thing you do is you take your eyes off the road and look at the dash. It's a, it's a horrendous system. You can override it um, with the switch down here. But unfortunately, every time you cycle the ignition, so if you stop the car and start it up again, it will reactivate. Thankfully, the lane change one, when you turn that off, it does stay off. Um, so that is quite a bonus on that one. I certainly wouldn't pay for those features, but they came as part of this package, so there's not a lot you can do. Um, other sort of complaints in here are the general lack of storage, uh, Jim, you know, Suzuki never really considered about you putting anything anywhere. There's nowhere to put a phone. There's it's just so little storage space in here. And they could have been creative. You could have had a little tray up here. You could have had like a sunglasses holder. And I've added some aftermarket bits that you can see on the dash. We'll talk about those later. Um, and they make a real big difference to the usability and practicality of the vehicle. Otherwise, you really are scrabbling about trying to find places to put anything. Um, which was, you know, seems like they'd never really thought about the vehicle. or Nobody went out and tested it and never had anything with them. Uh, you know, everybody has like a mobile phone these days and might have some other keys, glasses, wallet, bottle of drink. Who knows? Who knows? No other real complaints on the inside so much. Um, 
the black plastic round here shows fingerprints and dust a lot. I think it'd be nice if it wasn't that. And you can see we get horrible reflections on the binnacles and they are really distracting. They kind of, you kind of get like an opaque sort of flashing on them as you're driving along. Again, it kind of feels like did nobody actually do any sort of road test miles in the vehicle when they were signing off bits? But, uh, but who knows? So standard, standard options. What did we go for? I said this was the SZ5 spec, so it was pretty well spec'd up to begin with. Um, and Suzuki didn't offer a load of options, to be honest. They did offer some um discards but they were horrendous money um so i declined them so things we actually went for in the end is i went for the factory rubber mats now i, I do hear online that some people don't like these i would have to say the driver's one at least i don't have a problem with it clips in down here and as you can see after twenty-three thousand miles it's not particularly worn it's got no holes it's got no thin patches it is kind of tray like so it does come up a little bit and protect the carpet. Um, I admit it could perhaps come up a bit higher, but again, even though I've been off road in this, you can see we're not looking at sort of muddy carpets in here. It has done the job and it kind of stays in place. It comes as a set. So you actually get the passenger and the two rear footwell mats. Um, again, the passenger one looks okay, but it doesn't have any retaining clips. Um, it's just got these sort of spikes on the bottom and that does tend to walk about quite a bit so you know that's in place now this time next week it'll be sort of up in the footwell and in the back um it's the same sort of story if i've only got these sort of rubber spikes on and literally these things every time every people get in and out the back they end up sliding under here so and yeah, as you can see it's kind of a little bit deformed where it's been pushed under the seat and i haven't noticed so conceptually they're quite a good idea but perhaps a little disappointed with them overall i say the, the, the driver's one i haven't really got a problem with but the others i probably would like to change or upgrade at some point In the back, I did go for the proper load liner. Now this I've been really pleased with, because again, it's kind of tray-like, it's thick, um, and it just gives you that nice sort of flat space. Um, but it is also pliable enough that you can actually roll it up. Um, so you can then fold the seats up and it will just sit at the back here. Um, so that's, that's quite a good idea. I certainly recommend getting one of these for the price, um, and it stops stuff sliding about. Whereas without it, it's just shiny plastic on the backs of the seats. I can just pull that. Well, the seats would be, I've got some seat covers on them, but they were just shiny plastic under there and stuff would move about a lot. In the back here, because it was a SZ5, it does have this little storage bin as well. Um, it's quite small. Um, I mean, that is literally the extent of it. It doesn't go back any further. But as you can see, it's kind of handy. You can get quite a lot in here. I've got a kinetic toe strap i've got some d shackles in here i've got a coat i've got some tools some tape and spare number plate to put on the trailer um, and they've even got the detachable tow bar in there so that's definitely worthwhile although sadly it has these flaps that are meant to slide up so when you pull the seats up they slide um, this one is broken as you can see it's no longer attached so you kind of have to manually move that one up it's not the biggest problem in the world, but again, it's just a bit of shame that, you know, obviously the hinge system on it wasn't really designed to actually be used for the seats going up and down very well. And then the last thing I had sort of factory fitted or dealer fitted as an official option is down here, which is the reversing camera. So we can actually show that if I grab the key again. So I know lots of people sort of fit these and there are several options and I know different markets in the world have different different head units. So I'm not sure what head unit they're fitting these days um, to the current models. But in the UK, this is what we got. So if I put this into reverse, 
you can see the camera comes on. So it does have some lines um, to sort of give you a bit of guidance and some distance bits. They don't move. If I move the, the steering wheel, you can see they're completely static. And I would say the resolution isn't that sharp. Um, probably doesn't sharpen on video so much, but it is a bit blurry. I don't know if it's the display or the camera or a combination of both. I, I imagine it's probably the camera more than anything. It would have been nice if it was a little bit sharper, but one thing is really good, and I have actually got it fitted at the moment, but you can see the tow hitch is here. So the tow bar would normally stick out to about the yellow, well, not quite the yellow line. It does make reversing up and hitching on super easy, although you've got to keep it in reverse gear. So as soon as you take it out of reverse, um, you kind of end up losing the camera, which is kind of a shame. It would be nice sometimes if you could just be able to flick to the camera mode without having to put it in reverse. But uh, there you are. I do think that's worthwhile. I know the Jimny's quite small and like rear visibility is pretty good um, when you lean out over there, but the camera is just a nice addition and it was nice to get that one fitted by the factory. So that kind of sums up all of the factory fitted or dealer fit options. Now we have gone and put a few modifications in here as well. So first ones are these little trays. So this one came off eBay. I think it was about seven quid. I did glue some magnets on. Unfortunately, I actually knocked one of the magnets off uh, cleaning yesterday. So I'll have to stick that back on. Uh, and basically uh, your mobile phone just sits in there, but I've got a magnetic case. So uh, I did find if you went over certain types of bumps on the road, um, sort of violent ones that want to move both front wheels up at the same time, like a sort of curb style bump, uh, that the phone could tip out of there, but the magnets just are enough to hold it in place. Um, I've also got another tray here, which again, it was pretty cheap. I can't remember, I think I found that one on eBay as well. That was something like only 10 quid. Um, both of them are really handy. As you can see, I have got glasses in there. Um, I've got a bolt for something as well. And it just gives you a place to put some things down. I've got some handheld radios. So there was nowhere to sort of put these or wedge them, but at least I can now stick it up in this tray here uh, when you're driving along. So I'd certainly recommend those. The other things I did buy are these little door pockets. Again, I think they were like nine quid. And they're just these little bits here. I don't really understand the benefit of them having now bought them. I am Denard getting them and I only bought them because they were so cheap. But they don't seem to offer any real benefit. Um, I find they generally just collect dirt and dust inside. And even though you can kind of put a phone in here, it's not near any USB power to do anything with it. And on the driver's side, definitely you wouldn't want your phone there. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. And it, also your phone will tend to rattle about and be quite noisy. And for some reason, this one's, this fitting started making a little bit of a rattling noise. So these are actually gonna come off. Um, I'll probably just go in the bin, to be honest. But I wouldn't recommend getting those, but I would certainly recommend the dash top ones. Another thing I really would recommend, uh, I've got this from Jimny Bits, I think it's uh, from one of the Japanese sellers, um, is this little module here that goes beneath the switch gear. One, it's a really close finish to the factory stuff, um, and it gives you access to the original USB port, and there was an original cigarette lighter, but it basically gives you all 12 volt outlet, but it gives you a fuse feed as well that you can get to the fuse. It gives you two more USB ports and then two more 12 volt outlets. So that's really handy in the fact that I can run a sort of a high amperage um, USB port. That was for my dash cam, which the cable is currently there and actually got the cap dash cam fitted. But it means that when my partner jumps in the car, she can also charge from here as well. And I've still got a spare socket that I can like plug a CB radio into or anything else that requires 12 volts. Um, I think that was about 25 quid. It wasn't that expensive, but that definitely is one I'd recommend. Uh, the last sort of storage mod is this one here. So I don't really like the finish. It's sort of shiny plastic, um, which is a bit cheap looking and the rubber little bits in there tend to really hold the dirt and dust. But having a cup holder here is really nice because the factory cup holders are way back here. And as you can see there, they're really awkward to get to, especially if you're a bit shorter and have the seat further forward. 
I certainly don't want to be grabbing a cup of coffee that's got a lid that can come off. Um, you know, when you're going along, you just you know, it's just waiting for an accident to happen in terms of spilling it everywhere. So having this holder here is good. Bottles tend to rot rattle about in it though. It, it doesn't grip a sort of a, a standard 500 mil bottle very well. And if you've got anything tall, like a bottle or a tall cup, um, when you're in second gear, it might just touch it a little bit. But overall, I'd say it's definitely worthwhile in having a cup holder here. I have seen a few, I think you can get a cup holder that either clips on here um, or, or this side, um, or maybe even onto the vent. Don't particularly like those. I think they're just gonna kind of be in the way. Um, and I certainly don't really want to drink here or anything obscuring uh, any of the vents. So I think that's definitely the best place. The only thing I would say is, I know I had trouble with just jumping out of low range. And I always wondered if it was just a linkage. When this is in place, for some reason, it will go into low, but it doesn't take a lot and it will pop out. So for off-roading, I do have to just take this out. It's only held in with Velcro. Um, I suppose I could try sanding down and just removing a bit of material so it gives the, the lever a little bit more room. But I imagine what happens is it must just have a little bit of contact somewhere and it must just cause it to jump out of low range. You won't do it every single time, but it's enough that if you're doing anything where you want the control of low range, you're going to want to probably um, consider what you're doing there. One final mod is um, the head unit is Apple CarPlay compatible. That is brilliant. Um, I've never really used the, the factory navigation on here, uh, the inbuilt sat nav, because it's kind of rubbish. I, I, I've tried it when I first got the vehicle, but Google Maps for Apple CarPlay is certainly the way to go, or well, I suppose Android Auto if you're not on an iPhone. Um, so I did find this little debris down here. I um, can't remember who makes it now. I'll put it on there. Um, so that is a wireless Apple CarPlay adapter. So it just plugs into the factory USB port and you can leave it there. And then of course there's no trouble because I can just charge from one of the others. And this will connect um, wirelessly to the phone um, and you get Apple CarPlay on there. So that, that's worthwhile. It's not 100% reliable in terms of you'll get in the vehicle, it'll connect fine, you'll go down the road, you'll jump out. And when you start the vehicle, it doesn't connect. So all you have to do is sort of unplug it, and plug it back in again, and it sort of resets the device and it works. It happens more often than I would like, perhaps 30, 35% of the time, but it's not particularly a big deal. Um, and you know, you don't always need Apple CarPlay. And if it doesn't connect via Apple CarPlay, it will connect via Bluetooth, so I can still take phone calls, even if that bit hasn't connected. But I think that again, that was a worthwhile mod. That was on the more pricey side. I think that might have been around 90 quid. Um, but that, that was definitely worth getting for sort of daily use. If you're going anywhere on holiday where you want navigation, I would recommend getting that kind of thing. Moving around the vehicle, um, I did buy this from, from Jimny Star as well. So this is a throttle controller. I'd have to say very disappointed. I've never owned anything like this before. Um, all of my other vehicles have got cable throttles rather than electronics so um, I was kind of keen to sort of see what it does I believe there would be some benefit if you're like green laning or you know even now it's a it's a it's quite a bumpy field this year because it was wet earlier in the air where you know if you're going over the bumps your, your throttle goes a bit like this so you see the throttle pedal there so you're going over the bumps you end up pumping the pedal as you go over um, this has got an eco mode where you can basically change the uh, relationship of how much pedal movement there is to how much the throttle opens and how quickly so the eco mode i think would smooth it out and i believe laning it might have a use it's then got ways of making the throttle pedal feel sharper and you can go through several different modes and tiers and it does make the throttle feel sharper but all it's really doing is like you know if you move the pedal that much instead of say moving it 12 percent what it's actually doing is it's opening it 35 percent and you kind of get to a point where it just makes it quite difficult to drive because there's no progression it's just on and off and you also get to the point where you know you're kind of here on the pedal so you're like 50 percent and then the rest of it 
does nothing because you're already at 100%. It just reduces the travel on the pedal. They kind of touch it up big time with like, you know, throttle delay and maybe some diesels suffer from that. But having now had this and messed about with it, I think it actually drives best in just the normal mode, which is sort of bypassing the unit. It was 120 quid and I certainly wouldn't buy one again or recommend 121 unless it turns out to be really good when you're sort of green laning and off-road or on off-road trails just to smooth out the throttle. The more aggressive side of it, I don't know, you just, you know, you just put your foot down quicker. I, I, I just can't see any benefit. I tried doing some stats as well. I did some uh, 20 to, I think it was 20 to 70 mile an hour rolls. Um, and even having this in its most sporty setting, it actually turned out to be slower. Um, or certainly wasn't any quicker, but the actual stats I recorded were 0.1 or 0.3 of a second slower, um, having it, you know, increasing the throttle quicker. So I, I, I really don't think there was much benefit to that. Um, we have got some additional lighting here, so I did get a light bar switch. A shame it lights up a different colour. I think these switches are used in possibly a Toyota or something. Um, I don't know if we'll see, but it lights up blue whereas everything else lights up orange, which is really kind of annoying. Um, it's sort of sold again as being um, correct fitment for the Jimny, and yeah, it is. You can just see the plastic is ever so slightly a different color, but it'd be nice if it actually lit up the right color as well. Um, but we'll talk about the light bar when we go to the outside. I have also got a switch here, because I intend to fit a winch, which is just a um, you know an on-off switch run for a relay to power a winch i imagine that will also light up one color um, but it is kind of nice so i can just use utilize these these blanking switches here and i think the last interior modification we've got um are the seat covers so these actually came from south africa um i think it's escape gear is the, co is the company so they're canvas, they do several different colours, several different materials, um, and they're designed to fit the different um, specifications across the world market. So we've got the side airbags here, you need to let them know about that. So I assume, in theory, if the side airbag was to deploy, this stitching would fail uh, and still allow the airbag. Um, I'm really pleased with these, considering um, buying from South Africa felt like a bit of a gamble in the UK, that you're doing it all over the web um with somewhere that's you know a long way off that if it all went wrong you're not going to get your money back but they fit really well they shipped really quickly they were a bit pricey and that you do get stung with import duty and nvat as well and the shipping is reasonably hefty but i couldn't find anything else that was being offered in the uk um that was anything close to these um the original seat was black and i'll be honest it was just starting to wear a little bit on this um bolster here so I'm glad these seat covers are protecting them and keeping the rest of the seats sort of clean. And I also like the fact that they're a light sort of tan color, sort of goes with the paintwork and makes the cabin a bit brighter in area rather than having black seats. Fitment I thought was really good. Um, you know, they're canvas seat covers that are going over the old covers, so they're never gonna be quite as tight fit. But as you can see, you know, the seat backs look pretty good. We've got a slight ruckle on the driver's seat here but it's probably where I get in and out and you know obviously the driver's seat is used the most uh, and we've also got you can just see down there we've got the covers for the, for the rear seats as well so apart from them being a little bit pricey um, I would say I'm really pleased with the seat covers and I would certainly recommend them um, as a thing to do if you want some seat covers so on the outside we do have um, some mud guards fitted now these aren't actually genuine factory ones, although they seem to look exactly the same and the factory did offer red ones, but the factory ones were really quite expensive. Um, again, these are eBay and they were, I think a third of the price or maybe even a quarter of the price. They came with no instructions to fit, or well, they came with generic instructions for a different vehicle with different fittings and different mud guards, um, which was of no use. And it didn't seem to have the right number of bits to actually fit them. So I've kind of had to interpret it um, and watch a few YouTube videos of them being fitted. Uh, I quite like them. Um, they're all the correct thing, they're moulded, um, they're quite flexible, um, and they do just stop some of the dirt coming up the side of the vehicle. So again, sort of for the price, I'd recommend them. 
Um, I think the factory ones, the fitting kit would probably be better, but I don't think the material's um, particularly any different. My hunch is they may even come from the same factory, um, if, if they are not exactly the same. Uh, an early modification we did are the Jimny bit sidebars. Now, I'm pleased I fitted these, and I think if you're gonna go off-road, it's a must, because it really does protect that side of the vehicle, and the ground clearance on the Jimny is pretty low that you are really at risk of sort of hitting that side panel. And people also say the plastic scratches quite easily, which I haven't really noticed, but then he never really gets in contact with anything. Um, you can see we've got a few scuff marks on the actual sidebar. I would say Jimny bits, I'd certainly recommend them and their customer service has been really good. Although I did have a bit of a palaver. So the first set of bars we had went really rusty. They then sent me some more um, which had terrible powder coat on them. They had bits missing from them. They sent some more, which were scratched. So I think this is like the fourth set um, of bars they actually sent out to me over the, you know. I, I, the first ones were just over 12 months old when I contacted them. So I give them full props for the custom services. They've, they've sort of sorted me out. Although I do fear that these are also gonna go rusty. So I don't know. Um, I see the price has also gone up on them massively, which, you know, it's just the way of the world, but I don't think I'd pay what I did for them now, especially when they also list the ARB sidebars on the website. Uh, I'd probably go for the ARB ones, but I think if you're going to go off-road of any description, they are a really sensible thing to put on the vehicle. Tyres, so we upgraded those. I think I've done about 6,000 miles on the original tyres. Actually, I found the original tyres quite capable a lot a lot more so than i thought they would be even off-road um but i did want to get some all trains on here so these are maxis worm drive um i think they're called 80 80s i went for 215 75 15 whereas the standard size was a 195 80 15 so a little bit wider and in theory i think they're about 11 millimeters taller but the speedo seems to still read out by the amount it did before. When I say out, it reads slow. Or does it read fast? It reads fast. So if you're doing 30 mile an hour on speedo, you're doing 26, 27 in reality. And it's kind of really terrible. If you're reading 65 on the speedo, you're doing about 60 mile an hour. So with the original tires, it would have been even worse in theory. So I think you can go bigger. I think this was probably the right tire to go for uh, when I did and I thought I was going to be doing commuting but Covid and the world has changed and I haven't done the commuting. I'd probably go for a mud terrain if I was changing them um, Ideally, I think a 205 80 16 would be a nice size because they'd be about an inch taller They'd be a bit narrower, but it does mean changing the wheels and I really quite like these wheels and obviously there's a cost of doing that I think a 235 75 15 would probably be the next option uh, to go to a bit fatter than I'd like. Uh, I think narrow tires generally work better in the UK for most terrains, but I do think the extra height and clearance would be really good. So I have had this set on the diffs a few times and I say the ground clearance just isn't great. It does scrape underneath. So what we can't see, and I'll put some pictures up of it, is I have got a transfer case skid plate as well. Uh, it's actually an aluminium one. They do do them in steel, but you're not really bashing it that hard. So I think the aluminium ones are probably the way to go. And it also goes over the fuel tank. I did notice off-road that it was catching the transfer box quite a lot. Um, so on the sort of a, what do you call it, the breakover angle. Um, so I think it was worthwhile putting that on there. In theory, you lose a little bit of clearance by putting it on there, perhaps half an inch but I'd much rather it hit a skid plate than constantly keep whacking the transfer box. Um, and the last bit is the radius arm, so it still catches on, on the mounts for those. Let's just have a little see if we can get to them. So these here, um, it constantly catches those when you're off-road. Now, again, you can buy some little guards for them. They're quite pricey. I think they're like 120 quid for just four little bits of metal. Um, we will get them at some point which again I think is just going to help it not getting hung up on there and you just know you're not going to damage them uh, I think if you're on more rocky terrain it would certainly be a concern but 
I can't really have any complaints at all with with Jimny bits and I, I'd still buy stuff from them and I'll probably go with one of their suspension kits at some point so I'll give them a shout out even though we did have some trouble with the sidebars moving around the vehicle uh, we've got the Bravo snorkel which again I would have to say I'd give the company a shout out I think their custom service has been really fantastic but it hasn't been plain sailing I went for this snorkel because I really didn't want to drill a hole in a new vehicle in the wing, especially not a steel bodied vehicle. You know, it's just a place that it will rust at some point. Um, an old Land Rover with an aluminium wing, yeah, you're perhaps a bit more likely to do that. This one claims no drilling. It's not exactly true. You, you, you reuse a, a mounting here, but you have to drill a hole here. And I think there's one other bit you do and you have to take a little bracket off inside. But basically you just take the panel off so you can see the panel over here. Um, that basically does unbolt, but you do have to alter the vehicle. So putting the panel back on again might be a bit more of a challenge. I have had trouble with this vibrating and rattling. So this is actually the second snorkel they've sent through to me and they've sent some experimental hoses. To so say, I really can't fault the custom service. And I think we're at a point now where it's got rid of most of the noise um, but we'll have a look under the bonnet and you'll see where some of the issues still are around the snorkel. But I quite like the look of it. I don't really plan to do massively deep water wading. Um, but obviously if you're in a dusty environment as well, having a, a high raised air intake is quite good. You can swivel this round to point backwards. But if you look, there's not a lot of clearance here. It won't actually point backwards. It kind of points sort of diagonally sideways. So you can't reverse it completely. But again, I think that's one I'd definitely sort of promote. I think it runs better with it on as well. Um, I know there's lots of theories about sort of ram air effect and cold air intakes, but it definitely feels a little bit more lively with the snorkel connected and with it facing forward than when you've got it disconnected. And I have done quite a few back-to-back -back tests on that and, you know, sort of judge speed going up a hill, um, pulling in one gear, and it definitely will do a mile anywhere between one to three mile an hour more with a snorkel hooked up compared to it not being there. So snorkel, sidebars, tires, all recommend those. Around the front, I say the LED headlights, these things are fantastic. But when you're out across fields like this, I have found I wanted something a bit more and on some of the country lanes around here, um, you know, at night, you've got some wildlife that might come out. So I went for uh, a light bar. Now specifically wanted something that gave a spot beam, not a flood beam. So it's not the highest output in terms of lumens. I have reviewed this on my channel, so take a look at those videos. Really pleased with this. This is from Osram. I haven't had any need to use their customer service, but the warranty package looked good. The fittings all look good. So even though it's been on here for a while, nothing seems to be going rusty. Um, we haven't, as far as I know, got any condensation in there only thing i noticed is this plastic is just looking a little bit weird on the end there but really pleased with that and the performance was exactly what i wanted so i mean you could light up the end of this field uh, i think that the light bar was rated at a quarter of a mile and it literally will you can see stuff a quarter of a mile away which you wouldn't be able to see with just the normal headlights um and just to increase that you know the width of what you can see i added some little little spotlights as well um, again, these are Osram. They were quite cheap, much lower output than the uh, uh, the bar, but so they don't shine quite as far. But just down on some places, and like when you've got a big field like this, it will just light up a little bit more area. So definitely recommend the Osram lights. Um, and then we get to the front bumper. So I was quite disappointed with the standard bumper and the fact that it was very, very easy to impact it into the ground. So even though the Jimny's meant to have very good approach angles, standard, um, you have a whole heap of plastic that kind of sits here. And I found that going off road, you would very frequently impact the bumper. And I have read on the various forums that people have actually bent the lower bumper brackets where they've been hitting the bumper off road. So I definitely recommend some sort of uh, replacement bumper if you want to go off road. Um, this is the Ironman one. They did a couple of variations, one with a low hoop, one with a high hoop. Um, 
it's quite interesting how it fits it's not like fitting a bumper to a Land Rover um, it's basically got a winch tray that all bolts on to the chassis legs and it's got some extra supports you drill some holes out put bigger bolts in and then the bumper is like a clamshell that then bolts to the tray over the top um, I assume it's done to meet um, crash and impact regulations in Australia um, but it is a nice bar um, I do want to get a winch in there at some point um, I don't want to go too crazy it's only a lightweight vehicle so I'm thinking something maybe around six thousand pound winch um, I've been looking at some I think they're 13 and a half kilos or something with um, a synthetic rope don't really want any more weight on the front of the vehicle I know some people put nine or even twelve thousand pound winches the idea is to pull me out I'm not there to be recovery for other vehicles and you can always use snatch blocks and the like um, and extension straps if you need to move something a bit heavier or if it's a more difficult pull the, the bumper itself reasonably happy with it it's been on here three years just over three years now um, but as you can see it's just starting to show some signs of corrosion it's never been hit um, kind of would have liked the coating to last a bit longer maybe because Iron Man is an Australian company and you know I know you do still get rain in Australia but generally the climate isn't quite like the UK so we'll see how it goes I would say it does seem to be a common theme I don't know if custom service has gone out the window um, Iron Man 4x4 have the worst website in the world ever it's like impossible to actually understand anything on it and find the products of we're actually selling um, they also seem to have no interest in wanting to serve anybody outside the UK even though they sell stuff um, well, sorry, outside of Australia even though they sell stuff in the UK so the importer is a company called it's West Coast 4x4 they're up near Manchester they were a little bit hard to get hold of originally but eventually did and they seemed like really nice people went up there and they actually fitted the bumper for me while I waited and they all seemed like down to earth and really grounded but I know I wanted to get like the recovery points so they, um, Iron Man do some that come out of the slots there heard nothing tried contacting them tried getting hold of them and they just seem haven't heard a single word from them uh, it's really strange because I would have gone back and spent more money I might even have bought a suspension kit from them and I told them that so I might even have a winch fitted and you'd kind of think they'd want oh well, this chap's just come in and spent whatever it is 1100 quid 1300 quid having a bumper installed yeah you know, oh yeah if he says he wants to come back and spend more money with us but absolutely nothing so I've not been able to get the front recovery points and um, I've decided I'm not going to buy an Iron Man lift kit either because why would you want to go and give money to people that aren't interested in you that's uh, very strange so I can't recommend West Coast 4x4 um, and I can't recommend Iron Man if you're in the UK even though I do quite like the look of the bumper um, and you know it's, it's certainly served its purpose for what I wanted it for um, but we do need to get a winch in there Around the back, um, we've got a tow bar. I'll have to put up the supplier for it. I think it was Tow Trust or something. Um, but basically, it was a lot cheaper than buying the factory um, OEM detachable tow bar. Uh, I wanted to be able to tow a trailer or a caravan, so it really needed to be something that was suitable to do that. So it's like a swan neck that just clips in. Um, it's all UK legal. There was a cover on the back there, although last time I went off-roading, it must have popped the cover out which is a bit annoying haven't really got any complaints for the tow bar it fitted quite well um, I actually put that on myself um, although I did when I took the rear bumper off undercover, uncover a little bit of corrosion down here so that was actually two years ago again Suzuki were uninterested at all the, the, the dealer didn't want to know I treated it and put the bumper back on it's just one of those things that you know keep an eye on it obviously don't want the vehicle rotting um, but you know had I not taken the bumper off and had the dealer have done it I imagine they would have done nothing about it or not even bothered saying so kind of glad that I did that I would say I'm not entirely happy with the rear bumper I'd like to find somewhere in the UK that does like an aftermarket bumper sort of heavy-duty style one to match the front but nobody seems to do anything 
I've seen some in New Zealand that look quite nice and I think it's a South African company that does quite a nice rear bumper but none of them really fit what I want I want something that is at least as small as the factory bumper so I've not had any issues with this impacting anything and looking at how much space there is I think even going for a taller tyre I don't think you'd be rubbing the rear bumper and you know the overhang is quite short so um, our departure angle is pretty good but it would be nice just to have something that was perhaps a little slim around here but I'd quite like to keep the factory light units because if you damage one you can easily replace them if you're getting a bumper that's got bespoke light units in them if they go wrong well how do you replace them especially years down the line when that company might not be around anymore and if you're buying from overseas um, it just sounds like a real headache um, I want it to be able to use the reversing camera so to be fair it probably only is just a hole that you need to drill but again I don't really want to spend lots of money on a bumper and then have to start modifying it you know Suzuki offer this as an option at least in the UK I'd like to be able to just fit a bumper that I can plug the camera into I want to be able to take a UK license plate or number plate I've seen some that do some really horrible things um, and mount them on the tailgate here and look completely chavvy 1990s modified car with a you know sort of a 1960s style light on the top of it it's horrible don't want to be doing that um i'd quite like some recovery points on the bumper so obviously the bumper's got to fit suitable to do that and then have some way of attaching a recovery point because the factory recovery points are down here they're quite low that one they're not really rated for sort of serious off-road use as stated in the manual although they look quite beefy um, but the biggest issue is you can get to that one but how all the tow bars seem to fit they completely obstruct you being able to use them on the other side so you're down to either using the tow hitch which i know some countries is a big no-no i think generally with the type of tow hitch we use in the uk you don't use the separate chrome ball that bolts on it's just a swan neck you know it's, it's, that that piece isn't going to fail um but it's not ideal and obviously having a swan neck sticking out here it reduces your departure angle so you're going to hit it on the ground so you're kind of limited to using only one recovery point in. so you can't use a bridle and obviously it's on that side so if that side of the vehicle is stuck in a hole you've got nowhere to actually attach anything to but i'm yet to find anybody who does a bumper that meets all the requirements so that you know you just buy it bolt it on and be able to keep the vehicle doing everything it does now um, and i still want a tow so i think one of the ones i've seen in south africa has got um like a socket uh, a bit like a us style sort of socket i'm not sure how legal they are in the uk um but it i think it looks like it raises it up quite high so i don't think it's going to be any good for me because i still want to be able to tow the caravan and i obviously want to make sure it sits level and at the moment it sits lovely but we'll need to work on that um, last things are I've got a exhaust on here so I luckily bought this one second hand it's the Forge Motorsport one um, I have to say I absolutely detest the fake exhaust tip with the carbon plastic chromey whatever it is on there um, but it's kind of what it looks like I would say this, the standard exhaust was more rusty than I expected it to be when I took it off um but this one does sound really nice oh, i liked how quiet the car was um we can actually just start this up and give it a few revs yeah it was really nice having quite a silent car but i think it was the right thing to do got quite a burble on this one You know, on listening to other people with these on YouTube, that was a decider. I would not pay the recommended retail price for this exhaust. So I think Jimny Style have it at something like 1300 quid, 1200 quid, which is a lot of money because it's only two silencers and a short bit of pipe. Literally, it just goes underneath the passenger seat. Um, yeah, it's, for the price I paid second hand, well worth it. Brand new, I'd probably be looking at doing something different. But I am pleased I did that. 
you can obviously hear it when you're driving. Um, it makes a very nice, non-intrusive noise. If you're going at sort of 70 mile an hour on the motorway, you do hear it quite a bit more because it you just got that throttle open a bit harder. You're at like nearly what three and a half thousand RPM on the taco. 60 mile an hour, it's still very quiet. So that's quite a good sweet spot. But very pleased I've actually done that. Um, it does sort of bring me on to sort of noise in general is um, in this model, even the SZ5, you only get speakers on the front. So I believe all the wiring is here to be able to put speakers in the back. You just need speakers and the brackets. I haven't done that. And I haven't upgraded the speakers in the front because just running about when you're on sort of country lanes, it actually, it sounds quite okay. I never really find a problem with the stereo. I keep thinking, oh, should I upgrade the speakers? But like driving over here to, to film this today, I had music playing. I had the DAB radio on, listening to some rock music. And there's like nothing wrong with the speakers. They, they sound absolutely fine to me. Um, I know you can get more dynamic range by putting different speakers in there, but you're kind of limited. You're only putting one speaker in there. You're not adding a whole load of tweeters, um, not putting a sub in here. It'd just be a, a slightly better quality speaker. I think if I was doing a lot of motor miles, and even before I put the, the exhaust on here, you do just get that more noise, sort of drone noise, road noise, um, wind resistant noise at 70 mile an hour. And I do find then I kind of want more I want to see volume in terms of like turning the volume up, but more body volume of music or, or sound. And I think four speakers instead of two would do that job better. Uh, and I think people in the back, uh, they don't hear the, the stereo very well just from the front speakers. So if you've got kids or you're using the back seats a lot, um, I would say probably go and have some speakers put in. And it'd probably be worth it. And it's not a particularly expensive upgrade. On the rear seats, I do use them quite frequently. Um, I generally have it in this configuration with the load mat in here, but it's really easy to put seats up. Um, I've ridden in the back. I've done sort of a two and a half, three hour journey in the back. Uh, it is quite comfy. You, are, you have got plenty of leg room. Um, you just sit quite close. Two seats are quite close together. So shoulder room is a bit more of a premium. And if you're a really big person, then you know, you're gonna struggle. Um, other mods, I forgot about these earlier. I did just put some tie down loops in the back here. Um, I've kind of got a little fridge that you can plug in here. I haven't actually used them extensively, um, but I plan that I will do. So I think it's nice just to have something to, to strap things in. Again, it's kind of weird that Suzuki could have done these things from the off and, and didn't. Um, and it's sort of left to the aftermarket to actually facilitate that. Um, but it's quite a cheap sort of modification. And I think lastly, we're understanding here, one thing I do remember is the reversing light on this is shockingly terrible. And I mean, so much so that even through the reversing camera or your mirrors, you hardly know that you've got a reversing light. Um, it really is pretty bad. Uh, I have actually bought a separate Osram reversing light. It's not really designed for a reversing light. It's like a little work light. Um, so it's about sort of, I don't know, yay big, sort of four inches by four inches square, which I plan to mount on a bracket coming off the tow bar. I haven't got around to doing that yet, but what I have done is that we can just see a little bit of yellow in there. I've replaced the halogen bulb for the reversing light with an LED one, and that has massively improved it. The camera doesn't pick it up great. It kind of makes, I don't know, I think the camera doesn't focus very well with it when you've got that light there, but you can actually see you've got reversing light and certainly, you know, in your mirrors and when you look over your shoulder, it has made a big difference. Uh, I think really it, the problem is the fact that we've got the, the fog light, which is mandatory in the UK, so you only get one reversing light. I think had they designed the cluster perhaps slightly differently and had a fog light either side and a reversing light either side, it would work better. But they didn't. So we're kind of left with what, what we've got there. Overall though, I think it is still a fantastic vehicle. It is a good little four x four. I've used it for quite a lot of things. Uh, I have managed to damage the door trim here, which is a shame. And we did just scratch some paint as well in here. And I was putting in some ramps for a car transporter trailer. Um, a bit gutted I did that. I did scuff the bumper um, here as well. That was actually when I took the bumper off. 
I'd, I'd forgotten to unplug one of the, the leads uh, and the bumper landed on the floor while I was wrestling trying to, to get one of the leads off one of the light clusters I think it was and um, that's when I fit the tow bar so that one's on me let's just have a quick look under the bonnet so we have taken the bonnet on and off a few times because to fit the uh, the snorkel it is kind of mandatory so did give it a little bit of a clean under here it's amazing how much dirt comes up you can actually see we've got quite a bit of evidence of uh, off-roading down there uh, I could probably get in there with the hose and clean it at some other point but you do get quite a lot of uh, debris come up mechanically it's been really reliable I've not had to do anything with the engine um, you know it's just gone and had its annual services so that's all great I did buy this off of AliExpress uh, I think some places charge quite a lot for it not sure how much it does I think it's standard fitment in some markets but not for the UK uh, as you can see I've got a couple of clips I haven't managed to get in these clips are really difficult to fit um, and especially with the bonnet on the vehicle actually you know unless you're well over six foot leaning across and getting those in is quite a challenge so don't think that's a major problem and then we've got the snorkel so originally the air intake was from the side here um, and we've got these pipes here going out through there so the snorkel I'm actually really pleased with overall and I certainly would give a shout out to Bravo Snorkels um, who are based in Spain um, they've actually come out um, and they actually laser mapped the car because most of the development they've done on sort of left hand drive ones so these pipes are running at the moment they do cure most of the problems but you can see we've got a couple of witness marks and we've got a bit of paint missing up here I've, I've touched it up once um, not entirely sure what to do about that uh, I might just end up replacing these with some silicon hoses or something and build something myself based on their design uh, it does give a little bit of restricted access to the brake reservoir it's not the end of the world you can still see it and it's only a couple of clips to undo to get in there but we're kind of where we are with that haven't got any real major issues or concerns over it but you know modified vehicles do come at a cost of sometimes bits aren't 100 percent In terms of seating, um, I have to say I really like the seats in here. I find them really comfortable. Uh, I have a bit of a, a dodgy back from an injury uh, a number of years ago. The seats are a bit squidgy and I would say the, the material perhaps felt a little bit cheap, although with the seat covers on you don't, don't notice that. But I do think the general ergonomics and comfort of the vehicle is really, really good. That kind of lends itself into, you know, how suitable is it for daily use? I think it's an ideal vehicle for daily use. It's moderately economical. It's comfortable enough. It's quiet enough. Definitely spec'd well enough in SZ5 trim that you never feel like you're short of any features. There is no reason why you couldn't use one of these day in, day out. And indeed, this is my sort of primary vehicle that I do. I don't commute anymore. But if I was commuting, this is the vehicle I'd be doing it in. For touring... Again, I have done some longer journeys in this. We've been up to Wales a few times, been on holiday in it. Obviously, space is at a premium. You know, two people and luggage is fine. If you're taking four people, you're going to probably want some sort of roof storage system, which I haven't got, or maybe a trailer. But, you know, that's just the limitations. It's only a tiny vehicle. Uh, if you want more space, you buy a bigger vehicle, really. But the only problem I've really had doing longer journeys is the range is pretty rubbish the tank on it's kind of tiny so at like 33 ish mpg realistically you know you've got 200 miles and you've got another 30 miles sort of 230 and the fuel lights on and unfortunately the fuel gauge in this is absolutely dreadful that as soon as it gets down to wants to put the, uh, the fuel light on it takes away your estimated range and the gauge doesn't really tell you anything. It's kind of 10 digital blocks or eight, eight little blocks that appear on this little digital bit here. But you've got no idea of progression of how far through a, a block you are. 
it, it means you've really got to keep an eye on you know the range when towing was terrible is i'd calculated that even if it did worse mpg than what it actually did do that where my destination was within range however we got to i think we we're still 12 miles away and this has gone to saying that it had, you know we, we'd gone past the range uh, when we still had an estimated des you know range left so you're sort of driving blind because you know, I had a caravan on the back and it wasn't a good place to stop with it. And it's like, I'd much rather get to my destination, drop the caravan off and then go and get fuel, which is what I did in the end. But it was kind of all guesswork and the vehicle makes, makes it hard is you just don't know how much fuel you've got left, um, which means that the tank feels even smaller than it is. I, I'm sure I read somewhere that it's got like 33 usable litres. It might have been in the manual or something. I believe it's actually maybe even a 40 litre tank in here. The most I've put in is 37 litres, but sort of going from 33 to 37, you know, going back to Imperial, that's a gallon extra. So, you know, that's sort of 30 MPG, that's quite a big difference in terms of how far you can go with such a small tank. Uh, I just wish the fuel gauge was better. I'd like to fit a bigger tank to it. So I know, uh, I think Long Ranger do a 80 litre tank but I know you've got to mess about with the exhaust because the exhaust has to be rerouted. So I don't know how that'll impact the forged exhaust I've got on here. And I believe the fuel gauge doesn't work properly with the big tank. So that it, it I don't know why, but they can't recalibrate the gauge. So you'll still show a full tank when you've got half a tank, which is kind of awkward. And then of course, as it goes down, you, you again don't know how much fuel you've got because the vehicle is going to be wanting to bring the fuel light on probably when you've got twice the amount of fuel left in it as you used to before so even though you increase the total capacity you also increase the amount that is completely unknown to you as a driver i don't know it's quite expensive um i think i'll probably do it at some point but i think it's 1400 quid or something to buy the tank over here, I think Devon 4x4 sell it. Then you've got to either fit it yourself or get somebody to fit it, plus mess about with the exhaust. You know, you're in it for quite a bit of money, all said and done, because it's probably not a five minute thing to fit. But I think if you're gonna be doing long journeys, I did find that, you know, 200, 230 miles is not really long enough. And it was amazing how quickly you were sort of wanting to find fuel stops. And, you know, Wales isn't completely desolate by any, stretch of the imagination but it was amazing on a on a holiday away for a week just how often you had to keep an eye on the fuel gauge that oh yeah we're, we're going to go down this way and that and you know that's we're going to do it over 100 miles today quite easy and it's like well if you've done over 100 miles a day before it's like well actually you know we're gonna to have to plan a fuel stop in today because you know we're not going to get get back otherwise and you know out in the mountains out in the more remote parts of wales there aren't loads of fuel stops so you just want to be a bit careful. Not, I can understand people in Australia in the outback or you know, parts of Africa or Asia that you know fuel capacity might be a much bigger issue if you're going on big long journeys. I assume you'd take more provisions and perhaps carry additional fuel cans for emergency use. But that, that is one thing that I do think would have been nice from the factory. If they'd been able to give you like 50% extra capacity as uh, standard, that would have been really, really worthwhile. Other things we're thinking of doing, I say suspension, off-road. The vehicle is very capable of standard. Don't let anybody tell you these are not capable off-roaders, but they come on quite small tires. And even though the wheelbase is like 88.6 inches, I've got a Land Rover at home that's an 88. So, you know, 0.6 of an inch short wheelbase. You know, and this is rolling about on what should be 195, 8015s, and I've got 33 inch tires on the Land Rover you know and from the factory you'd have had something like a 31 or a 32 inch tire which all improves you know your departure angle your approach angle and definitely the breakover angle and that's where the Jimny sort of lacks is it can sit on its belly and on its diffs quite a lot with the small tires it just doesn't have the ground clearance uh, I went on a, uh, a Jimny event earlier in the year and got stuck twice once it sat on the diffs, um, just in a set of tracks where 
if I'd been in my Land Rover, you wouldn't have even thought it was an obstacle. You'd have just driven down it. And then on another bit where I went over sort of a side mogul and it just sat right on the, um, the side bar here, right, on, the, on the skid plate. And it was enough just that the front wheel had no grip on the driver's side on the opposite rear. And even with the traction control, so you could have all four wheels turning, but you weren't getting out of there. The traction control, I would say is brilliant. It's sort of a game changer in the fact that it will allow the vehicle to do things it wouldn't be able to do without it. We've got live axles, it's a ladder chassis, and it's got moderately good travel. But again, I'm from the Land Rover world, and a standard 90 has a lot more wheel travel than this does. Um, certainly, you don't lift wheels off the ground anywhere near as much in, in a 90 or even a least sprung sort of 88. Um, you, you wouldn't. Without the traction control, I can see that, you know, the Jimny would become unstuck quite easily. So I think the plans are, we want to go for a two inch lift. Not sure who yet. There's a few different candidates. I think I'll probably go with the Black Raptor kit um, from Jimny Bits. Uh, they seem to offer the best mix of things I'm after. They also do a three inch lift, but that's quite a bit more money because it's new radius arms. You probably want to get um, front and rear prop shafts. You've got to at least put a spacer in there. Um, but they, they do do some wide angle props. And I'm not sure how much more articulation you gain. So I believe the shock length on the three inch lift kit is basically the same as a two inch lift kit. And it's just some bigger bump stops. So the wheel, you know, it, it drops down further, but it won't go up as high. So I don't think you actually gain in articulation by going for a bigger lift, but obviously a three inch lift is gonna give you more clearance. Um, I'm swinging to the fact that I have other vehicles that are dedicated for doing more serious off-road work. That I think a two inch lift is the way to go on this. And they did kind of concern me that I got stuck so easily on the diffs uh, recently that I did think if I was green laning, following some Land Rovers that, oh, you, you could get yourself into a bit of trouble here on something that's quite mundane. So I don't know. I know a lift isn't going to give you more clearance under the diffs, but it does mean you can run to all the tyres. Um, I say, I think when these tyres are worn, uh, I will be replacing them with a set of mud trains, and I want to go that bit taller. Part of me says there's even a, like a 3950, 15, um, which might be a good option. So again, that's that a little bit taller again. I think they're like t uh, 29 and a half. Well, no, 30, it should be about 30 inches. I think they're 29.9 .9 inches tall or something. Um, you know, they're not quite as tall as the rated numbers on them. But again, you're going fatter, heavier, it's going to kill the performance. And I imagine you get, can get to a point where you're going to want to re-gear it. Um, at the moment, I think low first, it would sometimes be nice if it was a little bit slower. And the on-road performance, I don't want to completely kill the on-road performance because, you know, I do want to drive it on-road. But a lift kit, a winch, maybe a bigger fuel tank there's extra bits of um protection underneath for the for the radius arm mounts they're definitely all on the list to get over the course of the next let's say 12 24 months you know some of these things are quite pricey um if i start going away doing some laning and maybe some wild camping in it i might need to look at a roof rack um so i've seen a couple and i think there's a sort of an unbranded one that Jimny Bits are selling. I've seen it on eBay. I think it comes from Eastern Europe. That looks quite nice. But kind of, if you're doing that, you then kind of want to put a ladder on the back and it's all extra weight and it's weight up high, um, which I'm sort of less keen on. Uh, I also don't really want to put something on there that's going to cause a lot of wind noise and whistling. And I kind of think you don't know that until you actually put something on the roof. So unless I actually go down that route, I'm not going to be buying those kind of things for it. Um, I think a winch would be much more useful. And then I suppose the big thing is power. We've got 101 horsepower. Now, in reality, it's a sweet little engine. It sort of pulls from nothing. It's quite revvy and it keeps up with modern traffic. You have to drive it quite hard. But I think bigger tires and the fact that I do quite like speedy vehicles. There is a supercharger kit, but I think that's running at about 5,000 pounds. Um, to buy the kit and obviously you've got to get it fitted and tuned but I do think that's probably on the cards but as a longer term goal 
Uh, I believe it gives somewhere in the region of 150 to 170 horsepower, depending on exact configuration. So quite a big performance hike in terms of percentage. Um, and I think that will really transform the vehicle uh, on road, um, as well as if you're gonna put some bigger tires on there as well. Um, I don't think you'd need the extra performance off-road. Um, it's very rare you actually need full throttle. I know you often see people on YouTube that are driving like idiots, but you don't need excessive power off-road for most off-road situations. But I think it'd be quite nice to have a bit more poke there. But five grand is obviously quite a lot when you think the vehicle was only 19 and a half to begin with. But we're back in that scenario of, even if I sell it, what do I buy instead? Um, a new Wrangler these days in the UK is unbelievably over £60,000. Um, I think it's about 62000 for a Rubicon, which is a heck of a lot of money. Second hand, yeah, you can perhaps buy a JL for about thirty-eight grand if you're really lucky. But it's still quite a big jump up. So, you know, including the purchase price of the Jimny plus all the mods that I've done to it, you know, we're going to be well under that. I mean, to be honest, now, even now, I haven't added it all up. But, you know, the mods add up to two grand, maybe just over two grand tops, I should imagine. Tires are a difficult one to put in there because, you know, at some point you're going to buy tires anyhow. So are they a modification or are they just, you know, part of running a vehicle? You know, 19 and a half grand plus, you know, let's say even two and a half grand's worth of mods, which it isn't. You know, we're up to 22 grand total outlay. There's nothing else, even close, that's going to be new or newish that's going to be comparable. Even buying a JK Wrangler. So we didn't really get a very good spec Rubicon in the UK. It was an automatic, no air con, um, and had the wheezy, horrible 3.8 litre V6 in it. Um, rare as hen's teeth because nobody wanted them. So you're down to buying a Sahara or a Sport, which means a 2.8 diesel, no manuals after a certain year, and a lazy automatic otherwise. You know, that's still like 25 grand for a vehicle that's sort of 10 years old. I like the Jeeps, but I don't think I'd buy one. I don't think I'd go back to a Defender because you'd have to get a late model Puma to get the same sort of road manners and comfort. And even then it's still not quite as practical in terms of like, you know, having four seats. But they're stupid money. You're up at sort of 30 grand to buy one of those that's sort of 10 years old. Uh, at least a nice one. In summary, I think the Jimny is great. It'd be really nice if Suzuki perhaps would come out with something that would allow customers to then upgrade if they wanted to get something newer. Um, I'd love to see perhaps an EV Jimny. Uh, I drove an EV Mini a couple of years ago. You'd certainly want much better range than that did. That only did about 100 miles on a charge. Um, but the performance of it and the power was really quite nice. I think they were something like 170 horsepower, which, you know, you could perhaps tone it down a bit in the Jimny. But I kind of think this platform's got scope that you could put an EV in here. And if you could get something that got 200 mile range, you know, it's comparable to the petrol one. I'd potentially be interested in something like that down the line. But I don't really know what they're planning to do. I don't really want to buy a monocoque unibody off-roader. I don't really want independent suspension. I do really want something that's got live axles and is a bit more rugged designed for doing off-road work. So it's not just about coming across the fields here. It's about going and having a bit of fun in the vehicle as well. Um, I like the dimensions of the Jimny. I like the fact it's small, nimble. Um, you know, it's very narrow. Even just for going to the shops, that's good. You can put it in parking spaces. You wouldn't park a Range Rover. So definitely, it's a vehicle I'm very pleased I've bought. It's a vehicle I'm going to keep. I've got no intentions of changing at the moment. And I'll certainly recommend that if you're on the fence about getting one, Go and take the plunge. If you want a 4x4 vehicle that drives like a 4x4 and does 4x4 stuff, there's nothing to touch it. Unless you're going to be buying a Wrangler or a Bronco um, or something, you know, maybe the new Ineos Grenadier. But you're talking a totally different price league. In the Jimny's price category, you will not get anything new or newish that can get anywhere near it. Really fantastic vehicles.